got your back. No, God's got it for you. Watch your back. No, God's got it for you. I don't know how much more I can do this. You're gonna have to take it for me. On the last push, literally. Sam, Sam, working, leveling, working. Okay, guys, we're gonna have to start. Let's just start the turn. Good morning and welcome to Gardnell Mount Vernon Out of Methodist Church. If you're here in person, welcome. And if you're Facebook streaming with us, welcome. I have some scripture to start off. It's Isaiah 40 verses 26 through 31. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in, exha in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Let's worship him this morning. Why you ever chose me It's always been a mystery All my life I've been told I belong At the end of the line With all the other not quites With all the never get it right But it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time Well I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody all about somebody saved my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Well, Moses had stage fright and David brought a rock to a sword fight You picked 12 outsiders Nobody would have chosen And you changed the world Well, the moral of the story is Everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that devil start talking to me Saying, who do you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody all about somebody to save my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Nobody, nobody trying to tell everybody 
can stand in your presence and we can feel your love wrapping around us. God, I just, I just ask you to continue to draw closer to each and every single one of us, God. 
and to reach down deep into our hearts and um, just continue to change us, break us, and mold us into that person that you're wanting us to be, God. Give us direction and give us a path to walk on. And God, right now I know that we're not seeing people as much as we have in the past, but God, there's still ways that we can reach out. And I just pray that that the Holy Spirit would give us that prompting. There may be somebody that we all need to reach out to this week, God, and I just pray that you give us that that prompting and help us to, to follow through and just to be your feet, your hands and feet. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. In the goodness of God 
Good morning, church. Y'all doing okay this morning? Thank you for those who are here with us today, and thank you for those that are watching on Facebook Live. And remember, if something interrupts the live feed, uh, we'll post the service to the church YouTube channel uh, and also to the church website, gmvumc.org. If you'd like to make an offering there online, you can go to the website and do that. If you'd fill out a connection card for us, we would appreciate it. Uh, under gmvumc.org also. If you have a prayer request, we share those prayer requests with the staff and with the prayer team. Uh, and we want to pray for you if you have a prayer request. We're still in the midst of uh, COVID-19. It's hitting closer to home. Some of our members have had it and been exposed to it. Don't know if they have it yet. Uh, so we're still praying our way through this time in the life of the church. Uh, and even though we've been restricted in our facilities, the church is still the church. And we are out there in the world to be disciples and witnesses and examples for the love of Jesus Christ. We appreciate each and every member of this church. We appreciate each and every person who gives. We appreciate each and every person who's with us online. I, was, I shared the watch party this morning. So if you're watching this on Facebook, share a watch party. And just looking at my watch party, I saw people from First Methodist in Roanoke where I used to be the pastor. Thank y'all for being in. Saw some from Hoax Bluff First Methodist, where I used to be the pastor. Join us this morning. Some folks from Florida. Isn't that great? We've got folks from all over the country that are, uh, that are with us this morning, and we sure do appreciate you. Uh, I'm excited that Tyler's going to preach this morning. Tyler Slayton, our student minister, has got a very pertinent and good message to share with us, and we're going to invite him up. But first, let's pray over the offering. The basket is back here for those who are here in the auditorium, uh, and you can give online. Let's pray. God, we honor you and we thank you. We know that you are at work in our world despite everything that is happening. Lord, I know we, we confess you, to you this morning that we're tired and sometimes we're angry and, and sometimes we're in a bad mood and we're ready for this to be over with, Lord. I uh, know you're still with us. Your presence is still here. As Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40, you do, not, you do not faint, you do not grow weary, you do not grow tired. And we thank you for that. And we know that we can rest in you. We thank you, God, for your blessings, and we pray your blessings upon the offering. We thank you, Lord, for those who are faithful in their giving. Bless them, Lord, in a great and mighty way. We thank you, Lord, for your marvelous grace, for the opportunity to worship, for the technology that we have to touch so many people. We honor you today. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Sorry, Ashley, I hope that wasn't an important one. <laughs> there we go. Good as new. <laughs> well, good morning, dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to Gardendale, Mount Vernon, United Methodist Church. I'm so excited to see all of you that are here. For all of you that are online, we thank you guys so much for tuning in with us, and uh, it is my pleasure, joy, and privilege to be able to share with y'all this morning, a little bit of something that uh, God has just really rested on my heart. Y'all ever had a train of thought in the middle of the night that will not let you go to sleep until you get up and do something about it? Yeah, that, that was this sermon for me. 
laying there in bed about 2 a.m. Sabrina is long asleep next to me. Uh, and I'm just thinking, and I'm thinking, and I'm trying to shut my mind off. And God's like, uh-uh, this is too important. So I actually set up, and I like made notes on my phone, and that's where this sermon comes from. So <laughs> I, I know that this is definitely a God thing this morning, but I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. I'm a little nervous about preaching this sermon. I mean, I've gotten past the point where I get nervous being up in front of people. Uh, any other church that I've served at, and people from this church will tell you, I love a microphone. I mean, I mean, there are people that don't like hearing their voices projected. There are people that don't like seeing themselves on video. I'm the other kind of person that really, really loves it. So that, that's not what this is about at all. It's about the specific message that God has given me this morning. Um, we've been talking about uh, fresh fire, and Steve closed out his, uh, his sermon series of fresh fire last week, but I felt like there was a little something that God had been speaking to me that I wanted to add on to that. Um, and so if we could just jump on to Philippians 3, 12 to 13, Steve's uh, slide that we had. And uh, we will read through that first thing. There we go. 12 to 13, and it says, uh, Not that I have already obtained all of this, or that I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on, there you go, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So my subject this morning, we're going to be talking a little bit about toxic tolerance. We're going to be talking about toxic tolerance, and uh, tolerance is such a politically charged word nowadays. I'm certain that there are some people listening uh, simply from the title of my sermon, either here or from home, that are ready for me to just let them have it, whoever them may be. And then there are some of you guys that are listening and already like planning your rebuttal or getting ready to tune out or turn off the live stream. Just give me a minute. <laughs> if you guys, before making your judgments of what I'm going to say, would just let me say it, and then we can move on from there. Uh, but before I go any further, uh, let's pray that I can get out of the way and let God say what he's going to say. <sighs> Father God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to speak what it is that you've been laying on my heart. God, I pray that you would just remove me of myself and that you would fill me up and that not a word that I say this morning would be of me or from me, but that you would speak what it is that you would have everyone hear. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you so much for your love and for your presence with us. And so in your name we pray, amen. So I know it's super cliche, and I try not to do too many cliches, but I do want to start by looking at a definition of tolerance today. I think that it's so important that we know exactly what we're talking about, so I actually have two definitions somewhere. There they are, uh, and I got them on here too. So the first the first definition states that tolerance is the ability or willingness to tolerate something, duh, to tolerate something, in particular the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. And then the second definition here is kind of what I, cuts to the heart of what I want to talk about. It says tolerance is the capacity to endure continued subjection to something especially a substance, exterior stimulus, behavior, or system of beliefs without adverse reaction. Basically, it's as long as you can just grit your teeth and not react to something that you don't like or you don't agree with. This kind of tolerance that's toxic is just about, it's not about acceptance, it's not about changing the way you believe. It's not about looking at people differently. It's about gritting your teeth and shutting your mouth and just, I'm just going to get through this as best I can until I can't grit my teeth no more. That's the kind of tolerance that we're going to be talking about today. So, for example, my ability to tolerate my dog's barking and waking me up at 5.30 in the stinking morning can only extend so far 
before I got to get up and actually pay attention to them or before I holler at them to hush. My tolerance can only get me so far before I got to do something about it. Tolerance is only ever a temporary solution with an inevitable and oftentimes violent reaction not that far around the corner. I hope y'all can see where I'm going here. Tolerance is not a solution to anything. It's just kicking the can down the road, delaying the inevitable, and probably adding more fuel to the fire of conflict than would have been there in the first place. I look at the current climate of our country, and I would say that the tolerance of our black brothers and sisters to continue dying and living in the, president, the presence of overt and covert racism has run out. Amen? think that that has just run out. So not only does tolerance flat out not work, it just doesn't work, but tolerance is also not Jesus's way. Jesus was not a fan of tolerance either, and in fact, I think a huge example of his feelings toward tolerance can be found in John 2, 13 to 17. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture this morning. <laughs> John 2, 13 to 17, and it says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he fashioned a whip out of cords. That's right, Jesus stood off in the corner, took these cords, and he braided together a whip. Jesus braided a whip and drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Y'all ever mad enough you want to flip a table? I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying Jesus did. <laughs> to those who sold the doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Some translations say, stop turning my father's house into a den of thieves. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. That comes from Psalm 69, 9. And that verse also goes on to say, and the insults of those who insult you fall upon me. So Jesus was thinking of the Psalms, or Jesus' disciples were thinking of the Psalms, seeing his actions, remembering the verse that said, zeal for your house will consume me, and the insults of those who insult you fall upon me. We're supposed to take it personal. We're supposed to take it personal when Jesus, when God, are not given their due. So the religious people of the day had no problem allowing these sellers and exchangers in their place of worship because it brought in money to the temple. It brought in money to the temple. It uh, made it easier for them to make their sacrifices, made it easier for the people to make their sacrifices, and it got everyone out quicker. Everybody was able to come in, get it done, and get out. And it made them money, especially since everything was being upcharged. Everything was being upcharged. So never mind the fact that it ruined the atmosphere of worship in the place that was supposed to be God's dwelling place among his people. Never mind the fact that the people were supposed to bring their own offerings, that it was supposed to be something that came from their own flock, from their own home, from their own livelihood, rather than something that they just bought. Never mind all of that. Never mind the fact that it flew in the face of the law that the Pharisees claimed to love and follow so well. Jesus didn't waste any time, though. Because it flew in the face of the law, Jesus didn't waste any time rectifying the situation. Recall in verse 15, I said earlier, Jesus braided a whip. I'm not saying he was out there whipping folks. I'm not saying he was out there whipping people. It said that he used it to drive out the sheep and the cattle. I'm not saying that Jesus was violent with the people. But Jesus was mad enough, but collected enough, to stand over in the corner and braid that whip together to help him clear out the temple. Apparently this is how I think you use a whip. Anyway, I'm going to just, like I said, go ahead and figure it was used to run off the animals. But either way, if it was me, I might have taken a couple of shots at the folks. But luckily, I'm not Jesus, so. <sighs> Tolerance of the defiling of the temple was not something Jesus was willing to stand for. Jesus was not going to tolerate the defiling of the temple. Now, Jesus was not 
intolerant either. We see a lot of intolerance nowadays. Jesus was not intolerant either. As much as we're saying tolerance doesn't work, I really, really hope we can all agree intolerance is probably worse. Intolerance cuts out any attempt to temper yourself or hold back harsh words and just moves straight on to responding harshly and out of hatefulness. It's intolerance that causes us to label anybody who doesn't think exactly the way do as a socialist or a fascist or a snowflake or okay boomer. Shout out to the Gritty Hope podcast. <laughs> Y'all been listening to that? Yeah, uh, Steve and Katie Beth have been doing a podcast to sort of bring together the different generations. And if y'all haven't listened to it, check it out. There's a few of them on there. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on other places that people without Apple go. It's on Droid Marketplace or something. It, you'll find them. Email Steve. He knows where they are. <laughs> uh, I know that you guys have heard those labels being thrown around. Anybody that's connected to any kind of social media anywhere ever has seen those phrases. Maybe you've even had somebody say those phrases to you. Somebody call you a fascist, okay boomer, socialist, snowflake. Maybe you guys have used those phrases yourself. That does not come from a place of tolerance. It comes from a place of intolerance. Tolerance is bad, intolerance is worse. Jesus also did not like intolerance, made it pretty clear, especially to the intolerance of the religious in John 8, 2 to 11. I'm telling y'all, scripture, we're going to be there today. It starts out, at dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have basis to accuse him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. Jesus was just writing in the sand. He wasn't giving them the time of day. When they kept on questioning, they pushed forward. They pushed and pushed and pushed. They kept on questioning, and he straightened up, and he just said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he wrote in the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. There wasn't any braiding of a whip, but Jesus had no patience for the intolerance of the teachers and Pharisees. And he was quick to point out their own hypocrisy. He didn't do this to win an argument. He didn't do this to prove them wrong. He was trying to ignore them, writing in the ground, but they would not let up. They kept bugging him and bothering him until he just stood up and said, who of you has not sinned? He responded, to save the woman who they were trying to condemn with their own intolerance. And again, if you look here, you see another double standard in the Pharisees' line of thinking. And uh, you know what they say, it takes two to tango, right? Where was the man caught in adultery? I don't know. Tolerance and intolerance don't work and are never fair or just. So they can't be the way of Jesus. So what's the point, preacher? We can't be tolerant. We can't be intolerant. What else is left? You're not leaving us a lot of middle ground here. But the way of Jesus is left. The way of Jesus is left, of course. Tolerance and intolerance both always lead to conflict one way or another, whether it's now or down the line. But Jesus' way completely subverts the conflict altogether and unites us in our differences. The way of Jesus is the way of love. The Pharisees were always out to trick Jesus, 
to find a way to trap him in his own words. And another time that they tried to trick him, Jesus laid this out all very clearly in Mark 12, 28 to 31. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given a good answer, he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I know that Steve has talked about this before. If Jesus said it's the greatest commandments, it's probably worth revisiting. Love God. Love people. From these two simple things comes all that it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you wonder if something is the right step or not, just simply ask yourself, am I loving God and am I loving people? And the answer should be pretty clear from that. Is this an act of love or not? It's not always easy, but it sure is simple. What would our world look like if we responded to one another with love in every way rather than just gritting our teeth and pretending to like each other, or worse, responding out of hatefulness. Uh, my wife put down Facebook about six months ago. She couldn't stand all the trash anymore, but I still get on it every now and then. And uh, all I ever see, all I ever see is people unwilling to show love to one another. That and memes. That's all I ever see. Sometimes the memes are people unwilling to show love to each other. Sometimes they're just ridiculous. That's it. Sometimes there's German Shepherd videos. Those are okay, too. But seriously, like 97% of everything on social media that I have seen is people being unwilling to show love or even respect for one another. What would Facebook be like? For all of you old folks like me that still use it, what would Facebook be like if we could just inject some love of God and others into it? Maybe instead of responding to a disagreement with an argument or with a debate, what if we treated each other like human beings and understood we don't all have to agree to still be made in the image of God and have the same inherent worth as one another Last time I preached, it was, uh, it was Pentecost. And the scripture on the early church in Acts said that everyone got along and had everything in common. And I pointed this out last time too, but once again, that is worth revisiting. This doesn't mean there were no differences or disagreements. We read just a few verses before in Acts that they came from all different nations, all different tongues, that the apostles had to speak in tongues for them to be able to even understand them. There were differences. I'm certain there were disagreements. There were definitely cultural differences. And yet the scripture says they were together and everyone got along and had everything in common. This is because Jesus Christ can unite us even in our differences. That if we focus on our differences, it's all we're going to see. But if we focus on what we have together and in common in Christ, then everything else melts away and doesn't matter anymore. There is no difference too great to be united in Jesus Christ. There is no difference too great that Jesus isn't greater than it. So brothers and sisters, this is my charge to you. My charge to you this morning is this, to no longer struggle to tolerate one another. To no longer lash out at those who don't agree with us, but instead to see the image of God in every single person that you come into contact with. And to respond, not react, to respond to every situation by loving God and by loving people. That is how we are the church. That is how 
we become followers of Christ. That is how we follow in the example that Christ laid out before us. Love God, love people, period. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for the love that you have and that you show for each of us. God, for the fact that you don't have to tolerate us, but instead that you love us regardless of what we do. God, I just pray that you would help us to be more like you, to follow in the footsteps that you laid out to us here on earth, and to, above all else, love you and love others. It's in your holy and awesome name we pray. Amen. Come out of sadness wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, come flesh you begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, all who are broken, lift up your face, oh wanderer, come home. Lay down your hands, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless, all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary. Rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Let